If there is anything I've learned about the Edogate industry while working on this channel, it's that creators sticking to just one company during their time in it is a rarity. Why exactly that is, I can't say for sure. People aren't tight-lipped about what goes on behind the closed doors of the offices, but I figure it's probably to do with the typical creative industry trouble of needing to pile on projects to stay afloat. At least one silver lining to that is, if you got a favorite company who happens to close down or has a period of drought, chances are the staff who made it up are still around elsewhere doing their thing with friends new and old, but under a different label. Able. In case in point, I have extensively expressed my love for Black Psych on this channel. I even friggin' went out of my way to import the keychains they did recently. Look at this, they, they did them right, they did Himina right, they did my girl right! Games like the super queer Yomi no Goe shipping simulators and the anti-capitalist pro-minority uprising boomer shooter meets visual novels meets 2000s edge aesthetics gun katana stand out to me as some of the most creative titles of the 2000s. And even as the studio began faltering in the 2010s for a number of reasons, the people who made up its soul were still around. Take extravaganza and sadistic blood writer Izumi Banya, for instance. He didn't get his 100 plus games worth of credits just off of capital from Black Psych owner Ramba Amuse. Even while the brand was at their peak, putting out banger after banger, he was still floating around and doing contract work for everyone from Clock Up, the minds behind the horrors of Euphoria, to Omega Star, who made the cutesy wholesome Kano Free games. And it was during Black Psych's most tumultuous time that he found himself working with the up and coming studio, Bug System, on two little horror titles. The first of these, Shinya. Kukimi, often called Niku Niku, is one that I've covered extensively and can't give enough praise to. It's the game that really made me do a 180 on Nukige as a concept, a subgenre I initially understood as VNs with basically no story and just a ton of porn, but Banya used that framework as a strength, writing a moving story about the resilience of humanity, one which shows that even the faintest glimmers of hope can be enough to save us in the darkest of times. Much as I love that game though, I'm not here to make another hour-long video about it, nor talk about its recently announced sequel. What I I want to talk about today is instead the second game which Banya and Queen Seko artist Rubisama developed together under that brand. One which channels much of the same shockingly brutal and gory energy, but into something quite different. Fucked up lesbians! Manakashi no Yuri wa Kakusomaru, translated unofficially as True Love's Lily Dies Red by the translation group Pansu Dev, is a game that simultaneously feels nothing like Niku Niku and also everything like Niku Niku, a comparison that seems to be welcomed by the developers as the games are regularly bundled together on digital storefronts. In terms of thematics, Manakashi feels like a game that expands more on ideas that Niku Niku presented but opted to sideline in favor of its post-apocalyptic trauma overcome its narrative, by way of a very different type of narrative. She Yukukimi is about the world being destroyed in an apocalyptic alien invasion as one of the few survivors is taken hostage and forced to survive a time loop for the amusement of her captor. Manakashi is about traumatized and socially stunted queer girls attempting to not be traumatized and socially stunted queers, or just indulging more in it. Presumably, this is why I've been asked to cover it many times, because y'all are fiends for Toxiguri if the Dasaku video is anything to go by, and now you can consider that wish granted. I initially intended to cover Wide Album 2 this month, but for a whole number of reasons, including being in Brazil for a few weeks to see my boyfriend, that got pushed off to March. But as a certified appreciator of unhealthy characters, I'm not at all complaining about having an excuse to cover this. I'm always happy to talk about weird shit, and I found myself doubly interested given this game's production history. Though Banya may have been the lead writer, it was the game's main artist, Rubi-sama, feeding him a lot of the ideas based both on what she wanted to see in a Yuri story, and on what she experienced during her time at an all-girls school. Putting aside what that says about her school experiences, I think pretty much anything that comes out of those two minds meeting is bound to be at least interesting, though I wouldn't say Monokashi is quite as revelatory as what preceded it. That isn't to say it's bad, far from it. From start to finish, I found the game's thrill ride of wild drama, grounded themes, and gory spectacles to be engaging and captivating, at least enough for me to 100% it. But at the same time, it's also a game that, despite or perhaps because of its short length at around 11 hours, feels underbaked in ways both minorly annoying and potentially offensive. Endings sorely lacking for content, characters which arguably fall into dehumanizing tropes, and themes that don't always feel cohesive make for an experience that's still good but needed more time to cook. Nevertheless, it's still a game that hasn't left my head from the moment I finished it to where I am now as I write this. From chillingly honest depictions of how abusive relationships form, to discussions of how obsessions with love and purity can destroy people, and all tied up with a surprisingly empowering, if awkwardly delivered, message of learning to grow and accept your flaws. Monokashi is a game that I'm glad I've taken the time to play and write a video on. So, without further ado, let's talk about 2019's most exciting game about girls fucking up other girls. 
Set in modern-day Japan, Manakashi follows a few weeks in the life of one Manami Hondo, a student who just transferred to an unfamiliar high school in an unfamiliar town. Timid, shy, and quiet, she soon finds herself approached by one of the school's star students, Manami Kanzaki, a loner who takes a sudden interest in a new girl for their identical first names, claiming their meeting to be destiny. Hondo finds herself entranced in turn as well, but for a reason that seems different from the outset. She has a crush on Kanzaki, and having been bullied out of her previous school for being a lesbian, she's not keen to act on that crush until Kanzaki picks up on the scent and confronts her, leading the two to begin their slow and rocky path towards true love. Scared of facing ridicule and abuse again, Honjo stays close to her new singular ally in the world, quickly finding themselves in a world of pure joy and peace as their love grows stronger, blind to Kanzaki's more troubling tendencies until new details of her life become clear, ones which show that she's perhaps not the perfect girlfriend Honjo once thought she was. It's not long before before things begin taking turns for the worse, as a mysterious girl by the name of Yuko attempts to derail the Manami's romance, half to fulfill her own goal of separating the two for her own desires, and half out of a genuine warning over Kanzaki's past behaviors. As Honjo finds herself in fear of losing everything again and clinging onto the one person she can, worries begin piling up. Is Kanzaki really an abusive mastermind, or an innocent person stuck in something greater? Is Yuko simply an obsessive former lover, a worried sibling, or something else entirely? What past do these two share, and why is Kanzaki so keen on hiding everything about her from her new love? And just where will that love go? Somewhere pure, perfect, and blissful? Or perhaps something more twisted than Honjo could have ever imagined? If it's not already clear, Manakashi's story is one fueled purely by drama and character, because unlike many of Banya's other works, it's almost entirely grounded in reality. There's no sci-fi or magical elements here, instead being set in contemporary Japan with smartphones and cars, a fully alive human race, and a generally agreeable respect for the laws of reality and human bodies. And as expected from a writer as experienced with the craft as him, the cast here, though incredibly small, is all fascinating for how they build on and play with familiar character dynamics and tropes. First and tied for most important is Manami Honjo, a pure, sweet, passive cinnamon role who's incredibly shy but loyally devoted to those she cares about. Her seeming lack of experience of others besides her kind family and a friend group which betrayed her leads her to develop a quick attachment to Kanzaki and to be completely blind to all of her red flags through her fixation on novelic romances and a desire for love. Manami Kanzaki then is seemingly a polar opposite in some ways and a mirror in others. She is a perfect student, an incredibly direct and pushy person when she wishes to be an otherwise unreachable and is equally as enthused with the idea of love as her identically first-named counterpart. Although, what her idea of what love constitutes is immediately obvious to readers as a bit fishy, showing herself to be somewhat obsessive and controlling under the doting exterior. To complement our typical opposites attract type of couple, there's also a few other characters. There's Honjo's mom, who has to be one of the most sweet and accepting moms in any media I've read. There's Yoshizawa, the cool classroom teacher who's maybe a bit too overly familiar and seems like he's harboring some weird secrets. And then there's Yuko, that mysterious figure who keeps her past shrouded and causes Honjo to cast doubt on her knowledge of Kanzaki. Of the three I just listed, Yuko is without any doubt the most most important to the story and takes precedent almost as a third main character in some roots. She's also the one I have by far the most mixed feelings on, as while I won't spill the tea about her until I get to the spoiler section, her backstory and utilization in the main story are very questionable. And come to think of it, she's really the only cast member to have much explicit backstory. The Manakashi as a whole is a game that values brevity over exposition, and that goes as far as to establish very little about each character that doesn't, in some way, add to the plot. Even when it does add details, a lot of them tend to be snuck into dialogue in a way that feels very natural, organic, and subtle. With that in mind then, it's impressive how well Banya manages to develop this cast and flesh them out through their dynamics with other people. By the end, even the characters with the least important roles felt like full-grown people, and the main duo felt like friends I knew in and out. A testament to the quality of not just the dialogue writing, but the prose as well. Similar to Shini Yukikimi in the also previously covered Gore Screaming show, Manakashi opts to detach its narration entirely from the thoughts of a singular character, and instead convey the setting and emotion for an objective, present tense narrator who has no greater knowledge of the world than the reader currently should. Things around the characters and their thoughts are described matter-of-factly, and the elaborations on what's happening feel welcome and informative, while still brisk and easy to parse. The vocabulary is simple, the grammar is precise, and sentences rarely get complicated, making Manakashi have an overall incredibly low reading level, being by far one of the easiest games I've covered on this channel for newcomers to the Japanese language. Though, unlike its predecessor, this one does have a work-in-progress 
progress English translation for those who don't know the language. Far as I can tell from the little bit that's public, it seems quite solid, but without any substantial demo to go off of, it's hard to say for sure. Having just come off of White Album 2, it felt like a breath of fresh air to play something that wasn't so... Prosy? Don't get me wrong, I love protagonists narrating the world around them with all the style and flair of a masterpiece novel, but as I've said many times before on this channel, there's something admirable about being able to write concise, simple prose that requires little thought to follow and appreciate. Reading more works from interactive fiction authors has done a lot to bring that to light for me, and it's great to see principles of brevity applied to a genre that often favors purple prose. It's very similar to how Niku Niku was written, even down to how Banya doesn't allow this more objective style of writing to distract from the stories of the core. The great joys and deep suffering that the characters go through during the course of the story aren't at all downplayed, but given the appropriate amount of weight and care, never feeling minimized for the sake of entertainment. That isn't to say the game is indulgent, though. Just like a slasher B-movie has its fun with violence, Manakashi is more than happy to indulge in the gory exploits that the cast finds themselves in later on. And as I'll talk about soon in a spoiler segment, it has no qualms of getting intense to show the suffering that a relationship gone wrong can bring upon people. Manakashi is a game about many things, but it chiefly wants to explore, by way of common romance tropes and character archetypes, how codependency and the idolization of purity in love and others are quick ways to destroy oneself and others. And the usage of a queer relationship in this isn't just set dressing, as the game does a remarkable job at showing how marginalized sexual identities can change the ways in which abuse presents itself. The whole opening scene of this game is an incredible microcosm of this goal for how it takes a spin on a pretty typical Yuri introduction. Shy transfer student gaily stares at the assertive girl, assertive girl stares back and takes notice and it blossoms from there. It is super tropey on its surface, but even from those first few minutes, the cinematic directing does a great job of creating a sense of unease in Kanzaki's actions, straddling a line between lesbian tension and horror. Throughout it, the narration drops little hints of something a lot more complicated happening in the minds of our two soon-to-be lovers, and why their dynamic of submissive and assertive pure lovers is not born out of especially pure things. Honjo's shyness is not due to some inexplicable feminine beauty or being an ulu soft girl by nature, Nature, but because of the anxiety caused by her previous group of friends abandoning her the moment she admitted to having a crush on another girl, the whole town and school instantly turning on her. Which in and of itself is a solid and logical expansion on the trope of the passive girl, given that, at least from my own experience and what I know of others I've talked to, that passivity which society values is often caused by having been pushed down by others or told you're inferior. And Kanzaki's interest in Honjo, though in every way coming from honest feelings of love, is acted on by her in ways that are shown to be incredibly manipulative. She hones in on Honjo's passivity and seeming exploitability and uses that to push her way into her life, so drunk on the idea of finally being with another woman that she struggles to give them any sort of distance. One of the most recurring examples of this is how the second Honjo shows any sign of being lost in thought or considering an emotion other than happiness, Kanzaki pressures her into revealing what's on her mind. Though it might seem carrying in any other story and worth any other character, there's an emphasis played on how extreme Kanzaki is with this. Her concern becomes downright invasive, denying Honjo any right to her privacy just to satisfy her own anxiety. Honjo's lack of understanding about healthy relationships leads her to just accept all of this, compounding with her fears of being unable to find another person who could return her feelings. That is also something Honzaki uses to ensnare her, telling Honjo, once they're together, that she doesn't need other people as long as she has her. After all, they've fallen in love and love is all she needs, right? If anything happens, they can just escape, you know, like a story. It's a subtly chilling and frankly not at all unrealistic depiction of how codependent relationships form and how they persist. In this case, you have Honjo who's been traumatized into passivity and isolation, seeking comfort and security from Kanzaki, the first woman to return her gay feelings. And Kanzaki is deeply obsessive and controlling over the few people she pulls into her life, finding Honjo's passivity and shared conception of love as reassuring until any sign of independence comes up. Codependency like this is something that's unfortunately common and for a lot of reasons. It's something most often born out of histories of abuse, unstable households, harassment from society, and prejudiced violence. Things which lead others to desperately seek stability and care, even to the detriment of all around them. These can happen to anybody, but queer people, due to being part of a group marginalized by society at large, the law, religions, and so on, are statistically more likely to experience these things. This isn't to say we're innately more vulnerable to having unhealthy relationships and 
straight people, something for which very little data exists on it also has to deal with the fact that I just don't think straight communities has a great awareness of mental health as queer communities, which might give the impression that they have better mental health, which has not been true in my experience. But it is to say that when codependency and other toxic traits do come up, the shared experience of prejudiced abuse can create unique avenues for toxicity and control to rear its head. This is something I am unfortunately all too familiar with. I did that whole meet another girl and upend your life thing when I was 20, and while I won't deny that getting out of my house was one of the best decisions I ever made in my life, it also got me living with someone who was, at the time, not anymore, very emotionally and verbally abusive. And yet, because of my lack of experience with relationships and other people really at that point, besides one relationship which took me six years to recognize as also controlling and abusive, and because of the isolated and controlling home I grew up in, the fact that this was even a marginal improvement made it feel precious to me. It led, at multiple points, almost any time I started to wonder if this was okay or not, a question to come to my mind. If I leave this, am I ever going to find someone else who accepts me? Since many of us feel as if we can't trust others who aren't also queer, and because being openly queer is a risk in many parts of the world, we can end up sticking to the first person who provides us with any semblance of comfort and stability. After all, who knows if we'll ever find other people that accept that core facet of us, and who knows if it's worth the safety risk to do so. What made it even more difficult for me was the fact that many friends of mine, both queer and allied, echoed some of these sentiments. Not because they were intentionally spouting abuse apology yet, but because there is a legitimate and very important point that solidarity between queer people is extremely important in many areas, such as red states within the US, which is where I reside. And yet that need for solidarity can lead people who recognize often normalized forms of abuse in straight relationships, like codependency, to be blinded to or even approving of their manifest stations in queer contexts, because of how society attempts to isolate and dehumanize us basically everywhere. After all, I fought as a socially stunted and isolated trans youth. What was better, no community or messy community? The former was just sad and lonely. The latter, my brain adjusted bit by bit to the messiness, even as it meant tearing myself apart. At least it meant I wasn't alone. Monokashi is really one of the only pieces of media I've experienced which captures all of this with the appropriate level of subtlety it deserves. It puts everything in front of you and brings all these feelings of tension and fear to the forefront, but you never lose that sense of, it could be fine, until it's too late. It's subtle, tense, and uncomfortable, yet all of that is balanced with the allure of a relationship that feels endearing when it's at its highs. Banya and Ruby-sama manage to take ideas that even the most casual of romance readers are familiar with and spin them into something painful that's grounded in real, familiar experiences, all without feeling like the queer aspect of the narrative exists just because girls fucking girls is hot. Which it is, but I still appreciate horror stories of queer characters that, appropriately, are queer horror. Perhaps most exemplified when the game starts to take a turn for the bloody. Monokashi's back half sees a sudden, though very well built up shift from a tense messy relationship ready to blow up at any second, to an intense messy relationship that blew up within the last second, and following suit with that are a slew of very visceral gudo and other torture scenes. I'll spare you an itemized list of everything the game features, but even as someone who would like to consider themselves decently seasoned at this point, there were still a lot of moments I found myself having to wince and turn away for a time. But they aren't just here for shock value. They're definitely uncomfortable, and I can imagine a lot of people with a lower tolerance than me struggling to handle the game, but it does serve a purpose in a very Edogudo way, and that's to force the player to feel the same kind of horror, awe, and fear that the character feels in that moment, and the same kind that someone may feel during moments of abuse. The scenes work in tandem with the more subtle horror atmosphere which permeates much of the slice of life ish segments throughout the game. By themselves, they do inspire a lot of feelings of tension and discomfort, but there's something about the fictional gore and brutality here that makes all the discomfort of the scenes bubble up into feelings of cerebral, undeniable, visceral dread. The usage of Gudo here hits that same deep fear of the body being destroyed to convey what abuse feels like rather than how it typically presents. Because as I said in the Niku Niku video, episodes of emotional abuse may not be the same as having your arms ripped off, but it sure can feel like it, right? It's exaggeration for the sake of getting a point across, and I really don't think the game would be as effective as it is without these parts that straight up slam you in the gut, and it helps too that they, and the game as a whole, is generally well paced and meaningful. Except for parts of the back half. The true ending feels way too short and rushed, the other good ending feels totally thematically worthless, and one of the free bad endings is dragged way the hell out in a way that fails to contribute anything to the themes. That just leaves two bad ends as the only ones which work fully, which just 
baffles me because the common route is amazingly well paced. And this has nothing to do with the density of H scenes and the endings either because the common route has plenty, though they are fairly vanilla. Honcho and Kanzaki's very submissive and very dominant roles transfer over amazingly from the safer work portions of the game into these sequences. The couple of moments where Honjo is pushed to be more assertive over what she wants are super cute, the parts where Kanzaki pushes her way into the lead are incredibly hot, and Banya's more brisk writing here really helps to keep the pacing up at all times. Plus, you just can't beat Rubisama's artwork. Being released just a few years after Niku Niku and well after Rubisama had really developed and cemented her style, Manakashi's art will no doubt look familiar to fans of that game. It's soft, squishy, and very moe, a bit reminiscent of Hino Ue Taru of Clan Ad fame to me, though a lot less goofy and with a much less sharp feeling. Lines are gentle and thin, which works with the bright and vivid yet not wholly saturated coloring to create a kind of soft, pastelish vibe. It feels like you could pick up the characters and squish them like a plushie and get the most satisfying squeaky noises out of them. There's also many noticeable improvements over her prior works. What stood out immediately to me was her usage of lighting and effects. Comparing CGs between this and Niku Niku, Manakashi not only feels like it has far more lighting and detail within said lighting, but its usage is more considerate and better integrated. A more cohesive style compared to Niku Niku, where it sometimes feels like soft blurs and lens flares got pasted on after the fact. It also feels like the composition of scenes got a lot more creative, with much less Dutch angles and much more creative framing to take advantage of the wide aspect ratio in natural ways. Getting multiple characters close up in frame with an apt amount of spacing, showing full body shots from the side, making full use of the space on the sides even for shots with most of the action in the center, it all feels like cut above many other widescreen VNs. The only downside is that, like a lot of modern widescreen VNs, it's still running at 720p to maintain compatibility with older displays. But as I always say in these videos, download Magpie, use the anime 4K algorithm or pixel multiplier, and bam, it's good enough. Does it beat native 1080p or greater artwork? Of course not, but algorithms these days are pretty impressive, and even on my 20 7 inch 4K monitor, this looked perfectly fine. And the benefit of the older engine and lower resolution is that even the most potato of potatoes will run it fine. That aside, the presentation as a whole here feels refined to a polish, with only the littlest of rough edges here and there. The UI is more or less identical to what Niku Niku had, just given an appropriately flowery do over. The English fonts are a lot nicer on the eyes of no fucking papyrus anymore. The standing sprites are full of emotion and detail, conveying wonderfully the feelings of each character in ways unique to them, and the backgrounds are way less noticeable. 3D render e blending in really well with Rubisama's artwork. Even the scripting feels like it got bumped up a few notches. That cinematic feeling I mentioned before is all down to the remarkable use of panning, zooming, and cropping to convey feeling and tension, used liberally yet carefully to add to the atmosphere of respect to said atmosphere. It also pulls my favorite trick from Nikuniku multiple times, where a CG is at first zoomed in and later expanded to reveal the full scene, like a suspenseful shot from a horror movie or something. I'm also fond of how creatively sprites are used. Characters dance all around the screen and shake and jump and change expressions constantly, it feels very animated without ever really breaking the intended atmosphere. Whether that's gruesome horror or fun gay shopping trips with the girls, the scripting and the graphics as a whole are always in tune with what's happening, something the roughly 40 total staff members deserve major props for. Though they don't deserve props for this backlog. This is horrible, I feel like I'm about to go cross-eyed. Unfortunately, I think it's a little bit harder for me to be as glowing with the soundtrack. It was composed by a musician working under the alias Burton, who's got a fairly decent track record spanning over 22 years now. That includes the score to Ultima Domain and Sakusaku, neither of which I've played, but I've heard about here and there. And I mean, yeah, quiet nodding approval in a direction of something is how I feel about Manakashi's score. Okay, that actually sounds mean, let me rephrase that. Manakashi's score is totally fine. For the most part, I couldn't tell you anything about the 15 tracks that make up the in-game score, other than a couple of the more horror tracks feel overproduced and a little silly, and there's one or two memorable tunes I like, like there's a piano one, and it's also La Chifolia. I also do like many of them being named after different Latin names for plants. La Chifolia is a lavender, La Crema is a couple different things, Autumn Crocus is a poisonous iris, and Pennsylvanicum- Pennsylvanicum? Like the US state Pennsylvania? Ecology. There's also some issues here and there with the music being very misplaced in terms of timing, the only points in the game where I think the scripting actually misses. There's some moments of extreme mood whiplash which usually work fine as they convey quite effectively how an unstable relationship can wildly swing between feeling like your heart is about to get ripped out and feeling like it's about to have decades old wounds mended. But then you get times where someone just got murdered and five seconds later it's like, yeah, everything's great! <laughs> 
Like Niku Niku before it though, there's one big highlight in the soundtrack that has to be mentioned, the OP. The cream of the crop J metal band Denkade returns again to grace us with a banger song, this one titled Lily Toxicity. An amazing mixture of haunting piano riffs, thrashing metal guitars and drums, and an expectedly soft yet brutal vocal performance from lead vocalist Karen, it's all tied up with some lyrics that well embody the themes of the game. It's just a shame that as of writing this video, there hasn't been any hint of a full version of the OP being revealed. It's genuinely great stuff and I really await seeing what the full version is like. On an equally glowing note, man is the voice acting here amazing. And in the trend for this channel, it's made up of people that deserve way more attention than they've gotten, though I guess they got at least a few other recognizable roles this time. Mamiya Nanako plays Honjo here, notable for playing Porno in Dona Dona. Kazahana Mashiro plays Kanzaki, who also played Carla in Jewelry Hearts Academy. And Mizuno Nanami plays Yuko, who also played Kari in the Do you say remake, a role that she did amazingly. Of those three, it's hard for me to pick a favorite. Mamiya gives this really soft spoken, gentle tone to Honjo that suits her perfectly and makes it even more striking when she does take on authority. Kasahana makes Kanzaki incredibly seductive and enticing while never not feeling vaguely threatening, and Mizuno does a remarkable job playing the full range of moods that Yuko shows throughout the game. It's an all around fantastic cast with no big blemishes on the sound implementation side of things either. There were a few times where I thought some scenes were mixed quieter than others, but whether or not they actually were or I was just sleepy is something I don't quite know. It's something that couldn't be solved by just in my volume every once in a blue moon. And speaking of blue moons, and now with things that come way more often than them, I think it's about time to wrap up the non-spoiler segment of this video and dig into the core of Monokashi's content. Giving a story recap in order to dive into the themes, the multiple endings, and what it all adds up to is a queer horror story about trauma and what love truly is. If you'd like to play the game for yourself and care about spoilers, then I'd suggest skipping ahead to the end segment, wherein I give my overall thoughts and verdict. But before that, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the donors who make this content possible, from the sponsors, to the patrons, to the Kofi-ers, and everyone else, and shout out some artists that you should check out. Hello gamers, gamettes, and gnon binaries and gnomes I guess, and welcome to the Patreon segment, that time of the video to give life updates, channel updates, shoutouts, and to appreciate all the patrons, donors, and sponsors who make content like this possible. For the first of those things, I mean I guess the big thing is that as mentioned in the intro to this video, I am in Brazil. I saved up the cash between sponsors and budgeting my income, got a flight in and out, and have been cozied up in a hotel with my boyfriend. And man what an amazing two weeks it's been. I love the people, the nature, the weather, the food, the culture, the language, it's just all beautiful. Obviously, including my very handsome boyfriend. But really, it's amazing how much being out of the US makes you realize how much more vibrant a lot of the rest of the world is. There's something wonderful about going down a street and seeing tons of little shops run by people who are actually happy to be there, and also just happy people going about their days. It's way more warm than I'm used to, where the US often feels very cold. I could honestly write an entire short vlog about my time here, but I'll stop myself for now and just end this bit with a big thank you to all of my Brazilian fans. Y'all are my largest non-English first language demographic and consistently some of the most lovely people to interact with, and I'm happy to say I have loved my two weeks here in the state of Sao Paulo. I cannot wait to come back and explore more of the country in time. And in an effort to spread some of those good vibes around and give back to the community that makes this content possible, I'd like to shout out some creators who deserve way more love than they get. And if you'd like a chance to be shouted out in the future, feel free to drop me a line on Tumblr or Twitter. I'm always looking for new creators to boost as best that I can. The first I'd like to shout out is Kay Nova, who makes videos focusing on mecha games and media. I don't know how well I've expressed this on this channel, but I am a huge fan of mecha games, especially the old simulation types like Star Siege and Mech Warrior. So when I saw their channel come up in my recommendations, I was quick to click on it and immediately fell in love with what I saw. From tiny dives to comprehensive looks, he covers everything from Mech Warrior to Metal Wolf Chaos, and it's all just a ton of fun to watch and often very informative. It's also amazing to me just how fast he's improved his editing and writing. Their last few videos have been super snappy and well put together, making for by far some of the best mecha gaming content on the website. If you have any interest at all in big stumpy robots, then please go to his channel and give him some love. He's got way too few subscribers for the quality he's putting out. 
The second I'd like to shout out is Basement Brothers, a group of free guys who make videos talking about all sorts of retro games and tech, but mostly focusing on the Neo Geo and Japanese PCs. Specifically though, it's the series Mr. Jake's runs, PC88 and PC98 Paradise, that I want to give a particular shout out to. It is simply some of the best Japanese PC-centric content on this entire website, really the whole internet. As someone who mostly focuses on the adventure game side of things, I love Jake's content for going to the sides of JPC gaming that I've mostly ignored. Beloved RPGs like the original E's trilogy, influential action titles like Phallus 1 and 2, and other classics that most people outside of Japan have likely never played in their original forms, if at all. With top-notch writing, great production, excellent voiceovers, and solid editing, it is content that you need to check out if you have any interest at all in retro computer gaming. And toss them a couple bucks on Patreon, too. With those channels hopefully popped up another tab to check out after this video is over, I'd like to take a moment to answer some Q&As from patrons. So, vamos la! Nordy asks, What other retro machines do you have in addition to the PC-98 and iMac? I noticed an ADB keyboard in the Sex 2 video, but I don't think the machine itself has made an appearance. It actually has, as the black and white game you see briefly in that video is being played on my Macintosh SC. And besides that, I got an Image Writer 2 printer for it, the PC-98 XS, the iMac G3, and an old Windows XP Toughbook, and there's also some consoles. Cuba2006-11 and asks, do you ever plan on covering any of the system Seicom novelware titles, such as Dome, Chatty, Softo de Hado no Monokutari, and Sanju Hachiman Kiro no Koku? If I do, it'd be in some sort of early VN history type of video, which I do really want to make, but it seems like even more work than usual, so maybe when my life is calmer and I'm a bit more settled. Dree asks, have you played Sayo no Uta? I have, but it was so long ago I don't really remember much. Sayo was cute though. Lucien Rosenheim asks, what are the VNs you most recommend to people that are really early into learning Japanese? Pretty much anything written by Hiruto Masato on the PC-98 after Dokusei is not only interesting, but very parsable for newcomers. Outside of the 98, I have found Izumi Banya's work to be easy to parse, and that man has written a ton for all sorts of interests. Goblin Loner asks, would a furry original English language VN like Echo interest you at all? Totally, I've actually had it recommended me a couple times, and it's something I'd love to take a look at. Furries are super creative people, and Echo looks like a very interesting example of that. And with all those answered, I'd like to take a moment before wrapping up to give a shout out to this video's sponsor and friend of the channel, Very OK Vinyl. If you haven't heard of them before, they're a small label out of Ontario, Canada, publishing vinyls of soundtracks to games like Studio Lon's Giri VNs, Milk Outside a Bag of Milk, Steins Gate, and Saya no Uta, the last of which is getting a long-awaited repressing with pre-orders ending on the 14th. With gorgeous limited edition colors and effects, wonderfully mastered sound quality, and excellent packaging filled with goodies, it's bound to be as as cool of a release as the original was, and I love my copy of that. And all of their records get that kind of wonderful treatment, from the funky splatter pattern of Cotton Fantastic Night Dreams to the gorgeous packaging of Signalis. So if you would like to get a vinyl from any of their available stock, stay on top of repressings and sudden sales, and learn about their cool new releases, then head on over to VeryOKVinyl.com, sign up for their newsletter, and start building a collection of gorgeous, amazing sounding records today. And be sure to check out what they're distributing too. With everything from Castlevania to Pizza Tower, Cowboy Bebop to Little Witch Academia, and even City Pop Records now, you are bound to find something you'll love. Again, thank you guys for the sponsor. You're always a blast to work with and you always do cool stuff. Now I think it's about time to wrap up this segment. I want to, again, thank all of my supporters scrolling on the screen who make content like this possible. And if you would also like to have your name here and acquire a fuzzy feeling in your tummy, then maybe consider giving a one-time donation on Ko-fi or joining monthly on there or Patreon. In exchange, you'll get your name here, access to videos about censors, sometimes early access, the ability to ask me questions for videos, see a list of games to cover and suggest games get status updates, and occasionally other cool things. The minimum is just a single US dollar, the absolute lowest Patreon will allow, and there is no tier paywalling. A dollar is treated the same as five, is treated the same as twenty. This is my one and only job, so all money goes to paying my bills, keeping me afloat, and improving the content in practical ways with better equipment where I can. But if you can't or don't wish to donate, that's totally fine too. Liking, subscribing, commenting, and especially sharing is incredibly important to making all this possible. Plus, I'm just happy to read that people enjoy this stuff. The last video got some especially heartwarming comments from fans new and old, and the success of it overall has kind of just blown blown me away. It is by far my most popular video to the point even the lead writer saw it and loved it, which I thought was just awesome. And that couldn't have happened without everybody's collective support. So again, thank you everyone so much from all my donors to the cool sponsors like Very OK Vinyl to the viewers and commenters and just everybody. And let's get back to the show.
Picking up from where the earlier summary left off, with Honjo transferred into the new academy and developing an unhappy relationship with Kanzaki, some mysterious girl by the name of Yuko starts pushing her way in between the two. Though initially putting on a friendly front, the gothic Lolita-clad figure pops up one day at Kanzaki's home, prompting Honjo to leave in bewildered confusion and for her girlfriend to catch up and explain some things. Supposedly, Yuko is someone wildly attached to Kanzaki that lost her mind after a car crash killed her parents. The story checks out enough to Honjo, but gets complicated when she begins inquiring to her teacher and learns more details from him, that Kanzaki is the one who had lost her parents and was left only with a younger brother as family. Though she chimes in to confirm the former, having overheard the conversation, she conveniently leaves the latter out of the discussion. Things progress as they have been for a while after this. The narration gets interrupted briefly from time to time with interstitials of an unknown figure also obsessed with Kanzaki. Honjo and Kanzaki continue to deepen their bond even as Honjo begins to doubt that she's telling the whole truth of Yuko, and then Yuko keeps continuing to pop up, at one point pointing to a bruise that is supposedly from being hit. Though Kanzaki chases the mystery girl off and soon explains to Honjo that the attack was out of self-defense to avoid being assaulted, none of that stops Yuko from popping up again in the middle of the night to confront Honjo and attempt to convince her that she does not want to be of Kanzaki. By her accounts, Kanzaki is possessive, controlling, and will consume Honjo until there's not a thing of her left, merely a husk of a person. But Honjo insists that, no matter what happens, she he loves Kanzaki, so anything that happens is okay. Yuko seemingly accepts this confession of love until Honjo gets back to her place. Aided by her teacher who happened to be walking home at these late hours of the night, he gets her back safely, only to be suddenly stabbed to death by Yuko, who trailed Honjo back to her home to try and kill her too, revealing that the person in those interstitial sequences is Yuko. I mean, I feel bad for ever doubting this guy, he's just nice. And this is where the game fractures between two portions, Yuko's path and Kanzaki's path determined by how she gets away from the killer. Though Kanzaki's path is where the game's most interesting content lies, Yuko's path is nevertheless important to discuss, most particularly because of Yuko herself. This is also where that transphobia content warning comes in. Upon attempting to escape into her room, Honjo finds herself cornered by the uncontrollable goth gremlin, who, rather than immediately kill her, orders her to strip naked and get on the floor, soon being pinned down and degraded by them. And it is here, after much build-up on their part, that they reveal their big secret. They're a boy. Are we really fucking doing this? After sexually assaulting Honjo and taking her virginity, she finds herself completely distraught, sickened, violated, and feeling worthless. But without much time to think, Yuko tells Honjo that by losing her virginity, she's lost all of her value to Kanzaki and must break off the relationship. She's no longer a pure woman. They also begin to fill Honjo in on their backstory and why they've done what they're doing. And for as interesting as it is with how the game is now developing its theme about how queer people raise a conservative society and families are not immune to recreating and appropriating the worst aspects of those. I'm not going to talk about that right now because that backstory, as well as what just happened, is of way more importance. Yuko is not a girl, but rather a boy born under the name Yu, and the mysterious younger brother mentioned earlier at that. At some point in their childhoods, Yu had become romantically obsessed with Kanzaki despite being siblings, and attempted to force themselves onto her, which she rejected, proclaiming that she was only into girls and wanted nothing to do with a boy, let alone her own brother. Soon after that, she consulted her parents on the matter, who, besides being homophobic towards her, attempted multiple times to chide the boy on the matter, but none of it ever reached him. He merely pretended to be compliant so long as his parents were around. And after their parents died in the accident, the two found themselves left alone together in a massive estate with an inheritance, and with no parents to control them, Yu gave up any pretense of compliance. Where their whole cross-dressing thing comes in is in an attempt on Yuko's part to appease Kanzaki's desire. Understanding that Kanzaki is a lesbian with no interest in incest, Yuko began presenting as a girl, changed their first person pronoun from the more masculine boku to the more feminine atashi, and appended the suffix go to their name, all in an attempt to be a different person that Kanzaki would like. As revealed in their endings, however, they don't really see themselves as a girl. It's all a front to achieve their end goal of being with their sister, who they believe to be their true love. If I may, and I know this is a huge ask, Allow me to play Devil's Avocado for a moment before I tear into this. 
Monokashi does make some notable efforts to try and dispel notions of transphobia, most notably in the worst ending of Yuko's path, wherein Kanzaki tortures them by castrating them, telling them that they can't be a woman with that disgusting thing on them. An act and line of thinking that's framed as even more cruel, violent, and senseless than much of the other violence in the game. And if we are playing Devil's Avocado, then it's worth mentioning that the game is highly critical of the idea that people assigned male at birth are inherently more sexually violent or deviant than people assigned female, and that can be seen as criticizing the idea that trans women are abnormally sexually deviant men. Much of what Yuko does to torture Kanzaki in the ending where they win is also what Kanzaki does to torture Honjo in her own bad endings. Yuko even lampshades this by saying the two aren't all that different. Thus, the idea that gender has any relevance to violence is wrong, and the entire transphobic concept subsequently crumbles, as what you're assigned at birth, as well as your sexuality, has no bearing on your purity and capacity for destruction. If I'm gonna be generous here, and given Banya's otherwise progressive writing in this and other titles, including good trans characters and minded blood, I want to be, I think that's the message. Transphobia is an unusually cruel and degrading punishment and gender identities are relevant to violence and deviancy, so you're a dick if you use it against anyone, even people who are violent. That is a good message and one that I agree with, but I'm getting tired of holding this avocado, so I'm gonna stop. None of this erases the core issue that the mere presence of the deceptive crazy crossdresser trope itself is a problem. It is one of the most long-standing anti-trans talking points and to this day is something that gets used to say that trans women are just men who sexually the idea of women, that we're all just deviant freaks. And you might be saying, but Yuko is just a cross-dressing guy, not trans. And that's still a problem. As I just implied, trans women are often seen by transphobes as deceptive cross-dressing men, and Yuko's character literally being that isn't doing a damn kind thing to either feminine guys or trans women. I get that this game wants to criticize this trope, but it doesn't go nearly far enough into subverting it to erase the core issue. Something that could have made this work is if it did something similar to what the Saku does where the violence a gender non-conforming character commits comes as a result of societal abuse and medical maltreatment. The main character of that game, Yuki, commits serial murders in her route out of desperation to escape a society where her being intersex has resulted in her being betrayed, harassed, and abandoned. Her awful acts and instability are the fault of an uncaring world around her, and though that doesn't excuse them, that framing makes it possible to sympathize with her because it puts the blame on the larger system of homophobia and abuse. Yuko, though, Though, Yuko just got obsessed with their sister, attempted to assault her, got chided by their parents, and later threw on a whole false identity to try and appeal to Kanzaki while deceiving others around them. They are explicitly just a boy wearing girls' clothes to get into the pants of a lesbian, which is an exact stereotype that hateful groups such as trans-exclusionary radical feminists espouse. I mean, like, is there some big brain parody I'm not getting here by how absurd their actions to get with Kanzaki are, saying, like, yeah, this, this shit's stupid, who would ever actually do this? If that's the case, cool, but it does doesn't feel like that. It's not like I can just say that people working on this game were unaware of this either. Just as the trope is popular in the West, in both media as well as the news, the idea of straight characters being fooled or tricked by cross-dressing characters and trans characters is a common bit, being part of the premise for some pretty popular shows like Maria Holic, which is to say nothing of the countless other instances of it as a short-lived gag in other shows. Much as I like the message that it all seems to be trying to convey, that gender identity is irrelevant to misdeeds and that people of all identities are equally capable of such misdeeds, Deeds, the core fact is that it still flies too close to the transphobic sun. I am certain it's not out of bad intentions, and that combined with what commentary is here, as well as the possibility of this just being a parody of how fucking stupid and absurd that whole concept even is, makes me believe it's truly a misguided but well-meaning effort. But the attempts at subversion here, well, they aren't it. With that horrible mess out of the way, Honjo, practically held at knife point, follows along with what Yuko desires and heads to Kanzaki's place to either give her parting words or confess to what Yuko had done to them. If one chooses the former to get on the path of Yuko's ending, then Kanzaki is expectedly stunned by Honjo's sudden change of heart and promptly gets knocked out alongside Honjo by Yuko, taken to the basement and tied up. Kanzaki is tortured by Yuko as the hapless girl is forced to watch, and when given the opportunity to let Honjo free if she gives herself up, she she opts to do so, with Honjo seemingly escaping and endless leaks of torture beginning, all in a desperate bid from Yuko to break Kanzaki's mind into loving them again, or at the very least paying attention to them like she used to. And in the end, they get exactly what they want. After Kanzaki attempts to kill herself to end her misery, foiled by Yuko being a step ahead, she's informed that Honjo is in fact alive in another bedroom after she only faked escaping and was caught. Not wanting to die while there's still hope to be with her love, Kanzaki attempts to 
persist as Yuko makes their way to Hondo to murder her before going back to inject Kanzaki with a potent aphrodisiac. It's only then, with her lover dead and her mind broken by chemical dependency, that the last vestiges of her love for Honjo disappear from her mind, replaced by a desire for Yuko purely to obtain the medication and avoid the withdrawals. Whether or not this is actual love, or even the actual Kanzaki anymore, isn't of importance to Yuko. They are happy simply to receive a facsimile of love again. While I have my gripes with this ending and we're going to get into them, it does set the stage for one of the most core ideas to the game. That one-sided delusional conceptions of love are in no way love. That love which is received and given only after abuse, manipulation, and destruction of the other person is in no way love. Actual love is something which goes both ways out of each person's individual will and exists in more than the mind of the abuser. And fascinatingly, Yuko almost realizes this. In a hidden scene unlocked after otherwise 100 100%ing the game, an epilogue to this ending reveals that Yuko starts pondering whether or not Kanzaki actually loves them or simply the drug. Rather than try to fix anything, however, Yuko opts to dig an even further ditch by killing Kanzaki and tearing her organs out, wishing to preserve them to create a better Kanzaki that will love him. Not unlike an abuser in a real relationship, Yuko believes more control is the only solution to fix things. It's a solid reflection on how notions of exclusive love can become a corrupting force. Yuko tears Kanzaki away from Honjo and kills Honjo to keep her out of Kanzaki's life, then abusing her further and further in some desperate hope that they can erase all of those undesirable thoughts of other people from her mind. It's made even stronger by something I mentioned briefly earlier, that many of the acts which Yuko does to Kanzaki are mirrored in her own endings, performed to Honjo for even the exact same reason, keeping the person she's obsessed with close to her and isolated isolated from other people. Though she understands the acts as cruelty in this path, she too falls victim to notions of love in her own and excuses them when she performs them. Ultimately, all Yuko wants, and Kanzaki as well, is to achieve the kind of love which had been idealized by society and by stories. In his own words, a life in which they wake together, eat together, shop together, watch TV together, bathe together, fuck together, love together. A life which is sold as the ideal story with which to live out one's life, one which is so perfect and pure that no fault can exist within it. Hey, wait a minute, didn't I talk about the fetishization of narratives in the Sui Senka video, but it was better executed in that game? There's also some really clever writing here of how some of the Eroguro is used in a way not too dissimilar to elliptical writing, a style where segments are omitted for the sake of brevity. All of the emotions that Kanzaki feels over long periods of time get distilled into singular, brutal events, omitting weeks of events at a time without losing any of the impact. However, I have to caveat it with some, because this ending starts to lose track of its own pace. Past a certain point, it starts to drone on for ever with an abundance of scenes that feel like they exist to fill out a dictated character count. By the halfway point, I just started paying half attention to the scenes to get it over with, and if I weren't playing the game for a review, I would have just started selectively skipping. There's also the issue that, while I think this ending does develop a lot of interesting themes, those themes are just better explored elsewhere. Like, the ending title Confinement is more or less the version of this where Kanzaki's in control over Honjo and does the same things to her, and it goes into the horrors of isolation and idolization much better than here. It's still worth reading this, but it's a bit underwhelming compared to that. The far more interesting of the two Yuko endings is what happens if Honjo confesses to what Yuko did. In response to it, Kanzaki comes out and blindsides Yuko, pulling Honjo into the home in a panicked frenzy over her being dirtied. After taking one look and making one poke at her body, Kanzaki decides the only thing she can do is to remove the parts of Honjo that have been made impure to attempt to salvage her. She tears Honjo's womb out, attempts to wash it, but ultimately destroys it in sickened anger, and drags Yuko off the streets and into the basement as Honjo is bleeding out in the living room, taking all of her anger out on Yuko, castrating and eventually killing them. Horrified at Honjo's death, which she believed to be a destined loss after her being assaulted, she attempts to take her own life, but fails and winds up on the hospital bed. Alive only through life support, she sees a dream that's implied to be repeating, a day with Honjo that starts blissfully and perfectly, too perfect to ever be real, and ends with her being reminded of her sins as Honjo's womb falls out of her. でも、
This ending lasts all of about 30 minutes, yet it manages to so eloquently, or ineloquently I guess, elaborate on the common roots discussion about the toxicity of purity. Kanzaki believes that love is something inherently pure and beautiful, and anything performed in the name of it, at least that she approves of, is equally pure and beautiful. Likewise, if she sees something as impure, then that impurity must be removed in order for love to be given and taken. I've spoken extensively about purity culture on this channel, men being obsessed with the virginity, youth, and inexperience of women, seeing them as necessary virtues for a woman to be lovable, but Manakashi takes a discussion around these concepts and makes a parallel to them with the fetishization of gold star lesbians. For those unfamiliar, it's a often rather offensive, please don't use it, slang term referring to lesbians who've never had sex with men at any point, and one that a very small niche of people take pride in as a status that makes them somehow better or more authentic than other lesbians. Even just on the grounds of it regurgitating the idea that women are valued based on how much straight sex they've had is fucked, which is to say nothing of how it devalues women who have experimented to figure out their identity or people who have been assaulted. As both news outlets such as Cosmopolitan as well as random people on the internet have continued continued to point out, however, a lot of it is basically just regurgitating ideas of straight purity culture but through a queer lens in order to gatekeep. And I think what makes Monokashi's discussion of it interesting is how it frames Gonzaki's particular feelings about this as a response to abhorrent trauma. As far as we know as readers, Yuko is one of the only guys to have ever been present in her life, along with her father who was later revealed to have rejected her sexuality from a young age. As a result, she seemingly sees men as nothing more than people who will betray and hurt her. Even people like her incredibly kind teacher are invasive threats to be avoided, further pushing her societal withdrawal, and further increasing the toxic strength of the few bonds which she makes. And by few, I mean one. According to the teacher, the only person she's been close to in years is Kanzaki. However, her traumatic fear turned to disgust is most pronounced in a narrative with how it intersects with her beliefs on romance. To her, love itself is a pure thing, and so if a girl has been with a man, a type of person who has wronged her numerous times, then that girl is tainted. She is no longer pure and no longer worthy of love. Not only does she find herself unable to escape these pervasive, misogynistic, and oppressive conservative social expectations, but the breaching of those expectations touches on horrible memories of abuse and bigotry, which causes her to snap and destroy the ones she loved most by trying to salvage her. Because in her mind, mirroring the rhetoric of many conservative people and presumably her upper middle class nuclear family unit, a woman without her purity is no longer a woman of value. Therefore, Honjo was already dead. It's a scene that hit me especially hard because I'd spent really the last whole year of my life unable to escape from similar idolizations of purity. Those six years I spent in my teenage years in an abusive relationship were with someone who liked me in part because I'd never had a love before. I was fetishized as the ideal of a partner, a perfect version that would only be taken once only once, for a love the world could never tamper with. Even well after I left it, the fragments of that never really left me. The fact I'd never had any sort of physical sex with a man, let alone penetrative sex, became something of a fetishized aspect in my head. What others did or had done with their bodies was fine, and I've advocated countless times for people to not, I don't know, blood shame? But the fact I had no physical experience with men felt like something I needed to maintain until that one relationship, despite it otherwise being a very sexually open person. That was only further asserted when, late in 2022, I was physically assaulted. I had multiple depression spirals, I viewed myself as dirty and worthless, and eventually I started to raise in my head that because it wasn't consensual, it didn't count. I wanted people to believe I was pure because people, including the one who had assaulted me, were obsessed with my inexperience and wanted to, in their own words, pop my cherry. So I kept trying to find reasons that I was still pure, but the guilt that I had experienced weighed me down and I'd believe myself to be worthless. I wanted desperately to cleanse that out of myself somehow. With the help of my lover and my friends, I have worked myself out of that mental hole in the last couple of months. But I guess what still haunts me more than anything, and what this ending reminded me of, is that there isn't any way out of it other than to simply escape that line of thinking. Because if you chase purity, then at some point you kind of have to accept that no one can be pure forever. And there never has been any value in being pure. Conceptions of purity are ultimately just ways to enforce a status quo and create more hierarchies, with men on top and women separated into varying degrees of value in order to excuse different forms of abuse and discrimination being done to them. As this ending shows, however, through the graphic metaphor of Kanzaki physically removing Honjo's womb, believing it to be impure, chasing purity often means removing aspects of oneself for the sake of appearing perfect. The obsession with 
benefit and a hierarchical belief in the value of certain people is destructive. And in the end, this search for purity kills both of them all because, as Honjo says, Kanzaki couldn't let such a dirty thing be inside her, could she? And thus we segue into Kanzaki's route, wherein the most interesting ending of the game is contained. And to get to that, one has to see what happens when Honjo opts not to run away in her own home, but to escape outdoors and seek shelter with Kanzaki, as well as getting protection on her behalf because the second she arrives at her place, Yuko gets non-fatally stabbed and sent unconscious in an act of self-protection. After escaping indoors, Kanzaki explains the whole situation of Yuko the Honjo, as well as revealing that she might have done an oopsie herself. In Yuko's bedroom lays the poor lad's corpse stabbed wholly to death. Believing that he might pose further threat and unwilling to accept that his actions wouldn't warrant a death penalty, she killed him herself, an action she is confident would not create any future issues as he's effectively a non-citizen in the eyes of the government. He pulled himself out of school to be closer to Kanzaki, he has no identification, he has no records. For all intents and purposes, he doesn't exist unless the government finds the corpse. And Honjo wouldn't let the government find the corpse, right? Listen here, you little barnacle. No one, and I mean no one, can ever know about this. It'll be the end of you, it'll be the end of me, and worst of all, it'll be the end of me. That, combined with their teacher's dead body in Honjo's front doorway, serves as reason for Kanzaki to push for not reporting to the police. And though Honjo is initially complicit in this, her tone changes the next morning when she catches the news on the TV and sees her mother grieving over the disappearance of her child. She attempts to take charge of the situation and affirms to Kanzaki she wishes to call the cops, and though they initially seem complicit, client and offer the go to the station, they end up locking Honjo in the basement instead, fearing that she can't be trusted to take the right action. Honjo is expectedly very uncomfortable and terrified with this development, but Kanzaki keeps up a loving front and repeatedly states that it's for her own good. To try and distract from this, she effectively love bombs her, attempting to win her emotions over by having them take each other's hymen as a sign of love, coming back to that whole purity thing, leading Honjo's mind to become disarrayed in a mixture of horror and love. At this point, does she even really know who Kanzaki is? If she even loves her? This confusion and doubt serves as the basis for how the next couple of routes split. Funnily enough, I'd argue the bad ending that results from attempting to escape is actually the most thematically interesting and important in the whole game, while the two good endings are kinda underwhelming. That sadly includes the true ending. Opting to believe in Gonzaki's love, Honjo waits for her to come back to the basement after a while and confesses that even with what's happened, she still loves her, even as she feels hands around her neck being asked if she can love her more violent sides too. Rather than submit to it, however, Honjo returns the favor as they both tumble to the ground, and she explains her reasoning for the uncharacteristically assertive action. It's not enough for her to just accept Gonzaki's love, but she knows that she has to understand her as a person if they want to be together, even and especially her darkest and most impure sides. This is the point where their relationship finally takes a turn for the best, and the two snap out of the delusions they'd been living in. Honjo realizes that Gonzaki is not a perfect person, she has parts of her that are cruel, dangerous, destructive, and she's seen those firsthand. And with them acknowledged as they are, Gonzaki realizes that she's someone who needs help to contain themselves for the sake of others a task that Honjo is more than willing to help with. With their love more firm than ever and vowing to go through hell together if they have to, they work together to hide Yuko's body within the floorboards and hatch a plan to U-Haul out of the country together, catching a plane to some unstated English-speaking country to begin a new life. They find safety, get married, and after so much, obtain the peace they both wished for, as a couple with a mutual understanding of their flaws. On one hand, I do like how this ending cements Monogashi's ultimate message with a positive twist. It reaffirms that seeking purity in another person and in a relationship means to ignore parts of someone, and to encourage both destruction and self-destruction. The only way the two are ever able to foster something healthy is to accept they're both traumatized and act out in different, damaging ways. Honjo is too passive and accepting, Kanzaki is too aggressive and violent. They have to work together to balance each other's strengths and weaknesses rather than live in a delusion of purity where they're both perfect. The only way in which the Monomies are able to develop a healthy relationship is to abandon those notions completely. Because to borrow a cliche phrase, love is love. And I don't mean that in a liberal, let's all get along kind of way. I mean that concepts which are destructive yet normalized in heterosexual relationships aren't any better in queer ones. Codependency is codependency, whether it's coaxed in language of extreme nuclear family lingo, or it's rooted in the shared traumas and experiences of homophobic prejudice. Purity is still purity. 
whether that's because you believe women are used goods if they've been with another man, or because you believe lesbians are tainted if they've been with men at all. And delusions of true love are still delusions. Yuri is no more pure than Yaoi is no more pure than the heteros. We're all just messy people prone to fluctuating identities and life experiences and prone to these same failings and triumphs of the heart. Putting a gay spin on a bad straight concept doesn't make it a good concept suddenly because it's gay. It just makes it a bad gay concept. Same as with any recreation of homophobia, racism, misogyny, transphobia, or otherwise hateful ideas within gay colored women's or trans spaces. Being a gold star, a colorist, a trans misogynist, or a trans med does not make you better than anyone else. You are just taking cis by patriarchal tools of oppression and pressing them onto your own community, and when you start pressing them onto your own relationships, that can get even more destructive. The only path to salvation from this, as far as I see, is to abandon those concepts entirely, as the Manamis abandon their blinding and destructive need for purity. Whether or not that's easy to do, however, is another question because we all live in a society, etc., and we're all prone to recreating these things because we're raised in them. On the other hand, though, not only is this ending absurdly short, but the development in it feels way too abrupt. Honjo just kind of accepts that she got confined and has to be an accomplice to murder, and while I get that part of her character is that she's a love-struck, inexperienced lesbian that'll do anything for a pretty gay lady, I would too, it feels weird to me that she's barely affected by what's happened at all. And Kanzaki just seems way too quick to turn from puppy needs her keiji to, you're a real one, Umfi, you're okay. It's a really weird, kind of goofy ending that doesn't feel thematically inappropriate appropriate, but knee caps itself with a rush pace and lack of exposition. It really could have used some scenes of them as a couple after their escape to establish how they both grew with time. You know, like Kanzaki getting over her whole transphobia thing. But we don't get any of that, we're only left to assume they figured things out. The other good ending to the game is at least better in terms of showing a steady development, but it also feels like kind of a gag ending. It sees Honjo unconditionally accepting all of Kanzaki's love with no regard for her own being, wholly convinced that she'll never need anyone else in her life. And so, the two begin a daily life of isolation which grows more and more extreme, eventually ending in Honjo willingly being amputated so she can become fully dependent on Kanzaki, and I mean, just look at this, this is goofy. I don't even know what to say to this ending or what it's trying to say. My guess is that it's kind of a parodical, happier spin on how codependency can destroy another person, portraying all the horror of having your independence and faculties stripped in a dumb, playful, silly way which points out the absurdity at the core of it all. And I don't mind that, I suppose. It's pretty fun to see happy at Oguro as it isn't all that common, but I do feel the incredible and joy Honjo shows here almost counteracts the messaging of the rest of the game. Without a clear aspiration to aim high at its themes, it comes off as really out of place here. Even if the other three endings I've discussed so far have some problems here and there, they at least had clear goals that didn't border on self-sabotaging themselves with parody. Honestly, I would have preferred this been cut in favor of an ending where Honju escapes Kanzaki's grasp. Something hopeful showed a way out to convey that it's fine to leave toxic relationships. You don't have to stay in them in hopes they improve, because they generally don't, and you still take a ton of psychic damage while you're in them. Maybe something like that would have matched up to the power of the one ending we haven't yet discussed. Rather than submitting to Kanzaki's wishes, Confinement sees Honjo realizing what's been done to her is too much to bear, and attempts to escape by tricking Kanzaki, only to get immediately caught and have her ankle slit, soon after pushed down and punished for her betrayal until she apologizes clearly for her misdeeds. And thus, a new time of horror begins. She's locked in the basement and roped to her bed, cameras placed in the room to keep a watch on her at all times, windows bricked up so she has no conception of time, and all because Kanzaki not unlike Yuko, has become desperate to be loved again. She wants to break Honjo until she is satisfied with the feelings that Honjo is presenting, and has no desire to betray her, no negative feelings, only her misconception of love. It's a mind-numbing, horrifying cycle of torture, days passing by as every single one of Kanzaki's most violent behaviors blossom into their cruelest form, fueled by the fear that being betrayed has left her with. Honjo's freedom is stripped as far as not even being allowed to use the restroom alone, not even being allowed to think without being questioned. The second she drifts or sounds as if her answers are delayed, she's pressured or even assaulted until she admits to her thoughts, Kanzaki fully convinced she will be betrayed again until proven otherwise. At a 
a point, the facade of kindness breaks and her actions to Honjo become more and more sadistic, eventually leading Honjo to quake in fear upon just seeing Kanzaki, and eventually learning how to contain that fear so as to appear collected. That collectedness and desire to be unharmed seems as if it pays off when she's given permission to, again, eat food in a living room. Kanzaki attempts to reward Honjo further with their first bout of loving sex in an eternity, which for just the briefest moment sparks a fire of hope in her mind that maybe things will be good again, that maybe the love she felt was real and hasn't all disappeared in favor of sadism, that maybe she was wrong this entire time. But then Kanzaki chokes her, and chokes until she finishes, long after Honjo has stopped breathing. The morning starts anew and Kanzaki greets Honjo. She is lifeless and empty. They arrive at the dining table and she attempts to feed Honjo. She is still lifeless and empty. Kanzaki arrives at school to tell everyone she's packing her things and leaving. She comes back home to Honjo, who is still lifeless and empty. Though her body lives, her mind has been shattered from the abuse and her consciousness is dim, and Kanzaki seems to feel delight in this. She finally at last has what she read in her novels of love, peaceful days of nothingness with an unchallenged love. Even if Honjo can no longer speak, she still serves her purpose to receive Kanzaki's feelings to fill her heart, as seen the next day when Kanzaki speaks to the lifeless husk on the other side gleefully talking about a wedding, as Honjo can do nothing but let out the faintest laughter. She is lifeless, and nothing more than a husk. The reason I save this ending for last rather than the true ending is because I think it's the one that comes off as the most complete of them all and highlights every single one of the game's strengths. Each and every single erotic scene is brutal, horrifying, and discomforting, conveying the suffering that Honjo feels throughout weeks of torture. So effectively, in fact, that I started to get cold sweats any single time Kanzaki appeared on screen, just as horrified as Honjo was. It is brilliantly paced and disturbing in ways both subtle and visceral, melding the creeping horror of psychological emotional abuse with the visceral nausea caused by her mutilating. But more than that, I think it asks a very poignant question. What does the ending of codependency look like? What does it look like for another person to give themselves up in favor of another? And the answer it proposes, as shown in this final CG, the part of this route where Kanzaki is finally happy, is a husk. Not wholly dead nor wholly alive, a person stuck in a purgatory of another's mind as they idly oblige every request and have no strength to deny, a person who has become reliant on another for everything. Honjo, by the end, cannot feed nor bathe nor care for herself anymore. She can't think for herself. All that's left are base stimuli informed by whatever parts of her head haven't been withered by oxygen deprivation. And yet that is what Kanzaki, unaware in this path of her tendencies towards destruction, unaware of her selfish actions, wants most. Because it is with this that she doesn't have to fear losing someone. She doesn't have to fear rejection. She doesn't have to fear anything anymore because her love, both the person and the emotions, can't leave. Nobody can hurt her anymore. And throughout the entire duration leading up to this, it shows again and again that there is nothing Honjo could have done that would have been right by Kanzaki. She didn't make any wrong choices because there are no right answers in situations of abuse. It's easy to look back on your own or other people's and say that you could have done this or they could have done that, but the atmosphere this ending paints is the one that's felt during those situations, one which overrides any other thought. Overwhelming helplessness. What hits the hardest for me, though, is the release that the player is given after that final erotic scene and after the abuse ends. The morning after appears as normal but feels fake. All the music cues are there, but Honjo's inability to respond makes every single line of dialogue from Kanzaki feel forced, the prose lifeless. It's the hollow piece after the climax of a violent episode after weeks of stomach-churning tension. Only, rather than repeat the cycles of abuse like usual, or escape them such as in the endings of Shinya Kimi, it keeps going and begins to crumble. The music disappears, it becomes silent save for Kanzaki's voice, and time lapses to the next day as sickeningly soft and gentle piano music revives the soundscape over the slow reveal of Honjo's vegetative 
date. I started bawling the moment the music began playing, because this ending, for me, encapsulated every single feeling of despair, hopelessness, emptiness, and loss I had felt throughout those years of abuse and codependency. Because all of those were, truthfully, times that I felt hopeless and confused, inches away from the correct answer to a situation yet never able to grasp it, never wanting to talk to anyone about it, and never able to deny any of the things I was being told about myself or the world. I was told that most people would never understand me. I was told that I was too naive to ever fend for myself. I was scared to do much of anything on my own for fear of being lashed out, and what I did do was filter through others' needs and fears. I felt scared to talk anyone outside of approved groups, and even within those groups, I was scared. Though I was always told I could do whatever I wanted, that I should be an independent person, doing so was wholly at odds with how independent actions were treated. My life felt like a never-ending pool of contradictions that kept me from realizing the one truth in all of this that there never was a right response to any of the abuse I experienced. There's nothing I could have done to make those who abused me happy, because the only end that would make the abusers happy is to be a husk. I love stories of people finding power and escaping abuse. I think titles like Shinya Yukikimi before this, as well as many others I've covered on this channel, are ones which have the power to show people that they are not helpless to escape the life they've lived up to this point. They are stories which have pushed me to keep fighting on, even when I feel as if I have no great chance of success. They've made me feel, time and time again, that that 0.1% is enough to live for, and time and time again, that's been proven right. But I also believe there's incredible value in something like this, too. An ending which, through moments of unsettling tension, of brutal visceral suffering, of quiet false happiness, conveys what happens if one were not to escape. What would happen if you were to never stop giving in to that voice in your head that says, maybe if I just do right by them this time. It's emptiness. What lays at the end of that cycle of abuse and forgiveness time and time again if one fails to break it is emptiness. It is the sad reality that you can never make an abuser happy without destroying yourself in the process. And I think there's something comforting in gazing at that. While I don't think I'm ever going to erase those feelings of guilt and error from myself, I do believe seeing what comes out of never escaping has helped me to accept that I, and anyone else who has ever fought to escape their abusers, has made the right choice even if it's just a bit, and even if it's an amount that may be immeasurable come time, this ending has done something to quell the voice in my mind that tells me I could have done better. I couldn't have, and that's fine. I'm happy I did what I did, and I'm happy I've gotten out. I'm happy that I'm not a husk. Monokashi is a game that I really struggle to collect all my thoughts on and recommend easily. As I stated in the intro, I do seriously think it's a good game. It's got interesting themes, it's got neat characters, it had multiple moments that felt moving, tense, inspiring, horrifying, and everything in between, and it's got some banger art with an alright score to boot. But at the same time, it's also half-baked in many ways, with endings that feel half lacking for content and half overly long, a lack of polish and thematic cohesion present in its predecessor and other Banya works, and some plot threads that are questionable if you're being generous to them and downright offensive if you aren't. Because of this, it's not just hard for me to recommend this game, but to also know who I should even recommend it to. I guess if you're a fan of gory horror in general, it's worth your time as Banya writes good and Ruby-sama illustrates amazingly. If you're a fiend for girls fucking each other up and seeing how love can go wrong, there's far worse works you could experience It's pretty solid. And if you enjoy offbeat, weird, queer horror, then it is interesting in that regard for the themes it explores. I just don't know how well it comes together as a whole package, and not even that this is kind of jank but the jank is charming way, but in the this is kind of jank and the jank is really bothersome way. If you do want to try the game though, and it's not the hardest to get a hold of, DMM sells it digitally if you have a Japanese proxy and a credit card they'll accept, and physical copies are readily available on secondhand sites like Yahoo Auctions and Sudakaya. I got mine from a friend who bought it on one of those sites, and while I don't have it on hand to show in detail because I'm far from my residence in the US, it is a really cute box. Slim and compact, yet so noteworthy amongst others. Neat. And I guess that army of amusing adjectives is how I'd describe Monokashi as a whole. It's slim and compact, coming at just around 11 hours of a fast reading speed. It's so noteworthy in the larger sea of horror VNs, despite its flaws, if not just because it's proper queer horror, and that's pretty rare. And it's all around a game I could sum up as neat. Not amazing, not awful, just neat if it's what you're after and the flaws don't bother you. Or you're like me and they bother you and decide to write a whole hour-long video about the game including its flaws that bother you. I can't say for sure whether or not you or any 
anyone else will enjoy it, but I can at least speak to the fact that I felt it was worth playing. There's a lot that bothered me, and there's a lot I wish the game could have done better, but it was an overall interesting experience, and the couple of highlights it has really struck a chord with me. Even if I wish I could forget some parts of it, I can't say it's something I'm going to be forgetting anytime soon as a whole, and I'm glad for that. 